computer. Parting in progress. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are live. I'm going to pin myself so the recording will show me. Let's begin with a prayer and a blessing. So lubricate my throat here a little bit. Amen. I want to give a l'chaim and a wish and a prayer that even before we we begin tonight's class titled How Israel Wins, Israel will win. We won't have to do the class. And what, what that looks like, Israel winning, is not just, we've been hearing some good news out of Israel lately with the, this, this terrorist uh, and this uh, Hitler or Haman of today has been annihilated. That's all wonderful stuff. But good news, real good news, is complete and everlasting peace in Israel. And the truth is that that's, what's, that's going to happen when Mashiach comes, which we hope and pray for every day, not just the distant future, but it happens at any moment. At that time, we'll have true and everlasting peace. There will be no more evil, no more hatred, no more anti-Semitism. And you can see I set up the Zoom in a way that you can see the memorial board, which on top you have my dad's artwork with Jerusalem, specifically at the golden building is the temple which we, uh, every every Jew around the world prays towards Jerusalem. In our part of the world, it's east. We had somebody that was joining from Japan last class. Maybe he'll jump back on. He's in the US, U.S. military stationed out in Japan. So he said, there they pray north, but based, based on where, where they are. And I was in South Africa for a few years. I'm sorry, not north. They pray west. Yes. From Japan, That's they pray south west. Africa. I was in South Africa. We prayed north. They're shovel. North. And if you're in north, if you're in southern Israel, you pray north. We always pray towards the Temple Mount because even though the the Temple's not there, we believe that our prayers ascend on on high through the Temple Mount, even in the time of the desolation and the destruction of the Temple. How much more so? Very soon, with the coming of Mashiach, with the rebuilding of the Third Temple and true and everlasting peace, may it happen speedily in our days. Amen. Amen. We of course pray for uh, the hostages to be released. I believe the number is 101. Unfortunately, we don't know how many are still alive. It's been on the secular calendar, on the Gregorian calendar, a year yesterday that they were taken hostage and that the war began, this current war with Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis. It's nothing new, as King Solomon wisely says. There's nothing new under the sun, but it's been a resurgence. Um, and we're going to talk about that, that there's nothing really new with the situation in Israel. So we pray for wh whoever's alive should be released and those that unfortunately lo lost their lives, sanctifying God's name, uh, their bodies should be released so the families should have, should have closure and bury their loved ones. And of course, we pray for the success of the IDF, Tzvagin al Israel, the, the Israeli Defense Forces, who literally risk their lives every day, men and women, to our sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, to protect the Jewish homeland and the Jewish people. And um, let's hope that... Uh, Peace won't, won't be elusive, but it will be a reality very, very soon. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let us begin. I'm going to share a PowerPoint soon, and throughout the class, there's a series of videos. Now, this class, How Israel Wins, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's vision for achieving lasting peace was co-produced by JEM, Jewish Educational Media, and JLI, Jewish Learning Institute. Now, these are two major Chabad umbrella organizations. Jewish Educational Media are responsible for all of the uh, videos and photos of the Rebbe, Rabbi Schneerson. A number of years after his physical passing, 30 years ago, uh, they got together and they said, we want to preserve the Rebbe's teachings. The Rebbe was recorded often during the weekdays, not in Shabbat and holidays, obviously, for religious reasons, which is when most of the talkings happened. But there were plenty of weekday talks and interactions with meeting people. There were a lot of private that were not recorded. But they put the videos together with subtitles and so on, and they're constantly coming out with different topics as it relates to our reality, whether it's Israel or now the High Holy Days, et cetera. And they're responsible for that. And JLI, Jewish Learning Institute, has courses and adult education. They're the largest Jewish adult education provider around the world, and there are hundreds not thousands of Chabads that have their classes. We've done some of their courses, um, including the weekly Torah studies course that we've been doing. And we are beginning this year for the first time doing their flagship courses, which is uh, six week courses on various fascinating topics um, in seasons throughout the year. So they worked, collaborated together 
to put together this class. The Rebbe spent thousands of hours over the course of the years talking about Israel and its security and its uniqueness. And um, most importantly, the Rebbe was looked up to and respected, not just as a religious leader, but as a lover of Israel by prime ministers, by head, by uh, generals, by chief, chief of staffs, military experts, the politicians from Israel would regularly seek the Rebbe's counsel. And you'll see a video soon from the Shin Bet, head of the Shin Bet, who in 1991 had a private meeting with the Rebbe that we only found out about years later. And he sort of gives the Rebbe's credentials. So the Rebbe's guidance on Israel is not his own. The Rebbe was a, a tzaddik, a righteous man, who was a man of Torah. He was a man who embodied God's will and wisdom as it's in the thousands of years of Torah literature in the Bible, and then, of course, everything that follows it. So it's not his own, but he nevertheless uh, had the great ability to disseminate the Torah's teachings uh, in, a very, in, a, in a way that was clear and in a way that um, people could comprehend and hopefully accept. I will say that by and large, although they sought the Rebbe's counsel, Israel did not, for the most part, follow the Rebbe's guidance, unfortunately. There were times that they did, and there were major successes. Um, but it's not just the Rebbe's own words, it's the Torah's words. And if we follow the Torah's teachings, then we see success. Because as you'll see right from the beginning of the class, our only right and claim to the land of Israel is God in the Torah, period. So if that's the source of it, then we should follow its guidance. If your source of the right to the land is the Belfer Declaration or the United Nations Resolution, et cetera, et cetera, then that's where you get your arguments from and your justification. But it's from the Torah. And that's the reason why we're in the land and we have a right to the land. And that's where we should search for the answers to the challenges of living in the land of Israel. And that's what the Rebbe did. The class was originally made as an hour and a half class, a tight hour and a half. After preparing the material early this summer, I made my own decision. This is not going to work. I, I can't go through that much material with that much information that quickly. We're going to divide it into two parts. We did part one. Some of you here in person and some of you on Zoom were present. Part two was meant to be uh, before Rosh Hashanah, and it happened to be that the next morning, our whole family was flying to New York last minute for our daughter's surprise engagement, surprise to the community and to everyone else. We don't announce it until they're ready and until we go to the Rebbe's resting place and get his blessing. So I was not able to do this part two. What we're going to do tonight is briefly catch up part one and then do the new material that we didn't do in the first part of last week or a couple of weeks ago. He should be over there, maybe in one of the classrooms. He was waiting for you to come pick him up, for mommy to come. So uh, I'm going to share the screen. We'll begin with that video I mentioned where we show, um, so to speak, the Rebbe's credentials with regards to Israel, not just as a religious leader, but how much he was respected um, in the uh, in, in, in intelligent, intelligent, intelligence and military community. So let us begin here. Uh, let's try to begin here. Hold on a second. Um, I apologize. Why is this not playing? Give me a moment. Leave it to technology. We did it last time, right? Hold on. Okay, share. Let's do this again. Give me a moment, everyone. We can make this work, I promise. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One more try. Of 
worked last time, right? Some of you were here. When it was time for the video, the video went. But alas. Stop share. Ay, ay, ay. I miss the good old days with pen and paper, right? <laughs> okay. Share. Yeah. There we go. Thank you for your patience. You should be able to see it now. Rabbi Bikesh Lishmoa Madati Ala Matsav. הוא לא שאל אותי מה עושה השירות, במה מתמחה השירות, הייתה לי מיד איזושהי תחושה או הרגשה שהוא בדיוק יודע במה מדובר. כלומר, הוא לא זקוק לאיזשהם הסברים שלי או איזושהי מצגת שלי על מה, אלא מעניין אותו פחות או יותר אותם עניינים שבתוכן, אותם עניינים שבפנים, שבהם שירות הביטחון עוסק, וסיפרתי לו. סיפרתי לו את הדאגות שלי, את ההטרדות שלי בנושא הפלסטיני. כאשר אני סקרתי בפניו את הנושא של האינתיפאדה, אני התייחסתי יותר לאירועים המעשיים שקורים בשטח, ואת הניתוח שלי, של השירות, למה זה קרה, וכיצד אנחנו חושבים אפשר לטפל בזה. כאשר הרבי ניתח, הוא דיבר על כך שמדובר כאן בסכסוך שלא ייפתר, לא על ידי הפגנה כזאת או אבן כזאת או תוכנית טלוויזיה כזאת או אחרת. אני דיברתי בצורה הרבה יותר, הייתי אומר, קצרה, מעשית, הייתי אומר אפילו יותר שטחית. הרבה כמובן דיבר לעומק. הוא ניסה לנתח את השורשים, ניסה להבין יחד איתי, אם אלה השורשים, מהו הפתרון, מהי התרופה. הבקיאות של הרבי, גם בעניינים שאינם עניינים דתיים, במצב הבינלאומי, במצב הטרור, ולא רק במצב העם היהודי, מה, שנע... מה שנקרא, מה שנעשה אצל הגויים. מה שנעשה אצל השכנים, הייתה מרשימה מדהימה גם בהיקפים שלה וגם ביכולת הניתוח. על פי ה-ID שיש לי מרשיקה, אשר שם נסרקתי, הידיוס מכל פינס אוהבה, שלו התייחס יותר לשורשים. את הנצחיות קשה, שאת שותפות הגורל, נצח ישראל לא ישקר. בעצם הצורה שבה מנתחים הוא מנתח את הדברים, בעצם הצורה שהוא אומר אותם, ובעצם התשובות שלו או ההתייחסויות שלו לנושאים שהועלו בשיחה בינינו, אני מבין גם מה הוא חושב כיצד צריך לנהוג. לדעת אורך הזו בהקר שצריך לבטא את הבלי על משהו, על עניין עקביים. ובשביל זה הקמנו משהו, וזה ההפך של הטבע של ארצס הבריס. ארצס הבריס נסקיימה, נסיאזנה, נסקיימה, על ידי זה שם לו חזר, שמה שהוא חיוני בשבילו, אין איך שבזה לבצע. אני זוכר שבדרך במכונית למלון חזרה לניו יורק, עצמתי כך את העיניים וניסיתי ושאל... לשחזר את השאלות ואת הניתוחים, כמה אני צריך להתעלות מעל המצוקות היומיומיות וההשתלבטויות היומיומיות שהן קיימות למכביר. ההתייחסויות של הרבי יעמדו לעולם ועד, מכיוון שהרבי לא אמר או לא התייחס לאיזושהי תקופה שתסתיים ב. הרבי התייחס לה 
לנושא העקרוני, להתפתחות, לתהליכים. והם נכונים היו אז, הם נכונים היום, ואם אתה שואל את דעתי או עניות דעתי, הם יהיו לעולם ועד. היא עדכנית לרגע זה, כמו שהיא הייתה מבחינתי ברגע הראשון כאשר ישבתי איתו בתחילת שנות ה-90. בסופו של דבר חלק גדול מהם התקיים, ומה שלא התקיים עוד יתקיים, בצורה כזאת או בצורה אחרת, כמובן תחת מאפיינים ותחת אה, אה, רקעים אה, שונים ו- ומשונים. אבל אין ספק שהדברים הם ללא ספק אופטימטיביים גם ל... Okay, so that Yaakov Perry was the head of the Shin Bet. If you notice during the video, they had showed a house, not Chabad World Headquarters, a house on President Street, 1328 President Street. That's the Rebbe's private residence. The head of the Shin Bet met privately with the Rebbe. It was... unknown to anyone except the Rebbe's personal secretary. That's why he didn't meet at Chabad headquarters. It was not on the Rebbe's schedule, printed anywhere, et cetera, written. It was not even on his. He was in Manhattan. He came privately. And um, there was a reason for that, because these talks were top, top secret and confidential. This interview with him, the Shin Bet is the equivalent of the FBI in, in America, Secret Service. And he... he I uh, was interviewed not that long ago, way, uh, many years after the Rebbe's passing. And you can see he's not a religious man. And he's coming from a, a viewpoint as somebody who was celebrated as one of Israel's best uh, leaders of the Shem Bet. And he's talking about how the Rebbe had a grasp and that what the Rebbe knew what was going on and what he spoke about either happened or will happen. And his words and his counsel is forever. Now, the reason for that is not just because the Rebbe is a prophet and a righteous man. That's all true. Well, because the Rebbe is talking the words of Torah, which is eternal. The circumstances may look different. You may call it the PLO then. You may call it Hamas or Hezbollah now. But the dynamics are the same. And that's the point that we, we want to uh, get to tonight. And I say that in my introduction. So when you hear the Rebbe's teachings, you understand. You could say, well, the Rebbe physically passed 30 years ago. No, but everything, his guidance, are the core issues. Okay, so let's talk about the core issues. First, some bad news, because Jews like to hear bad news. I'm just kidding, God forbid. Yesterday was October 7th. We don't have to talk about the tragedies. We know it. We're familiar with it. <clears throat> it's, in our, it it's, it's been all over our news feeds. Personally, a few weeks after October 7th, I joined a Chabad Rabbi Solidarity Group. 30 rabbis just jumped out of their communities and went for a week just to give hugs and give support. And we saw it, and everybody's been affected by it in one way or another. In your books, for those that are here with us in person, we're not going to go through it in the class because time is of essence, but we show about the terror. We go through the major terror attacks. Unfortunately, there's way too many to enumerate, but on page eight, we, page nine, we have the major ones going all the way back, by the way, to before the founding of the modern state, Hebron. to the Hebron massacre in 1921, where 67 Jews were butchered and hacked to death with axes. And then we speak about the Fadiyin attacks in the 1950s, and et cetera, and the various bus bombings and the Lud The Lod Airport massacre, now known as as um, um, Ben Gurion Airport, then it was in Lod, for the Lod because it was in the city of Lod, and so on and so forth. I personally experienced two of the ones that are here: the Machne Yehuda market attack in 1997. I was a yeshiva student in Israel, and I was a few blocks away when that happened, and I personally experienced the aftermath and the shock and the anxiety and the fear amongst Israelis. 16 Israelis were killed, and I was also there. A few years ago, a few years after that, a month after Racheli and I got married, Passover massacre 2002, we just got married a month prior in New York, and then we went to Israel for Passover, and 30 Jews were killed, unfortunately, at a Passover Seder. So these are all real. My, my wife lost an uh, uncle and a first cousin, and many of us have family or friends, etc. So we know we know the problems. On page 10 and 11, we go through Israel's major wars and victories. Again, time doesn't, doesn't permit. But those who are here in person, you're welcome to take a booklet home. Those who are joining on Zoom, uh, you could take some extra copies. But let's get to the, 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 if we define the issues, it will turn, turn down to three major issues. And I'm going to share a PowerPoint again here for everybody. Hopefully, it'll go smoother this time. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know what happened to this screen. Hello? Hey, Rabbi, it's Natasha. Uh, Can you save me a copy of How Israel Wins if you're... I'm not sure who's talking, but we're, we're happy to... Any extra copies? It's Natasha and Isaac. Oh, hi. Yeah, yeah. any extra copies here. But I'm not sure why you can't see it here in person. Um, let's see. Oh. Slideshow from the beginning. There you go. Okay. So I'm going to try to go through this a little bit brief, uh, as quick as possible, because a lot of this is material we covered. But there's three vital principles. For, I'm sorry, before the vital principles, there's three problems. It's not in this, this PowerPoint. Number one, Jews in Israel have died and are dying. That's a sad reality. Number two, there's no clear, it's, it's page 12 in your books. That's where it is. It's not in the PowerPoint. Number two, A, B, there is no clear plan as to how to resolve this intolerable situation that has persisted for nearly 80 years. And if anybody here argues or has any any other ideas, please pipe up. But this is something I think all Jews agree with. Jews in Israel have died and are dying. Sad reality. There's no clear plan as to how to resolve this intolerable situation that has persisted for nearly 80 years. C, Jews around the world are scared and are exposed to terrible anti-Semitism. We've seen that over the past year. You would think that after October 7, when evil Hamas who the world calls terrorists, okay? They When they breached the the, uh, the border and they came into Israel and they butchered, raped, murdered, burned men, women, and children in the most horrible ways, and they say that what we know is not even a, a tip of the iceberg as to the, 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 the atrocities that took place. We just know numbers. Um, there was a movie shown last night in, in Kineo, Silence Before sil Silence, Screams Before Silence about how especially the women were treated. I mean, terrible things. You would think that the world would not be more sympathetic to the Jews and Israel and our cause. On the contrary, that's when anti-Semitism became stronger. Hezbollah, that Israel is dealing with now in the north, when did they start their attacks against Israel? The next day, October 8th. Oh, they were attacked over there? So now's our chance also. And so on and so forth. So we clearly have an issue here. The source of it, as to as to how to deal with this, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to share a different PowerPoint. This is step two. Give me a second. Again, I apologize for the technical issues. We're trying to do a little bit of last week and new of this week, and I don't want to do too much of last week. Um, last week was very smooth, but it, uh, not last week, a few weeks ago, but it was specific to half. And here we're trying to do the first half or the second half. As my grandfather, blessed memory, used to say, a Yiddish expression, you can't take hot um, noodles because it slips off the, the, the <laughs> slips off the uh, the fork, right? So, okay, here we are. So, um, here we go. Now we got it. Th this is the problem. Jews have died and are dying. Number two, there's no clear plan to end the cycle of violence. Number three, Jews around the world are being exposed to terrible anti-Semitism, as you see. Uh, instead of supporting Israel and the innocent, they're supporting Hamas, they're supporting the supposed you know, poor Palestinians. Of course, and we'll get to it actually later tonight, there are civilian Palestinians. You could even call them innocent civilian Palestinians um, that have died, many what the real numbers are, whether it's 40,000, who knows? That that includes terrorists and they mix them all together. But the fact is that's true. But that's Hamas's fault. Um, and of course, Israel doesn't want that. And they do everything they can to avoid that. But the world has taken, not everybody, but too many have taken the side against the Jews. There's some good news, though. People are open to new solutions, which has not always been the case. The Torah has the answers. We're going to hear that tonight. And we all can make an impact, first of all, by getting educated. So here we go. I think we did that video already. Now, let's get straight to the issue. What is the answer? What is the response? So last time, we, and we'll do it again tonight briefly, we built 
a foundation. This is the most important thing you're going to hear tonight. The foundation to the Jewish approach to Israel and its security is human life. Human life is of utmost importance. This weekend is Yom Kippur. Everyone knows that on Yom Kippur, Jews fast. If someone's life is in danger, they're forbidden from fasting. The way they commemorate Yom Kippur is by eating. Now, obviously, only if you have to, if your life is in danger, if a doctor says, and you, you only have small amounts that you need to eat, you don't overdo it, and so on. But my point is, is that life is of utmost importance. We desecrate Shabbat, holidays, all of the Torah, in order to preserve life. Included in that is that if God forbid there's something which is a threat to life, it must be eliminated. I'll give you a controversial example. It's not in the class, but I'm just going to give it to you because we're familiar with a lot of the topics being discussed now on the campaign trails. One of them is abortion. According to Torah law, abortion, there's a word for it. It's called murder. You're taking the fetus of a child. It's it's an, an it's a a living a living entity. It's a it's a human. And you're and you're you're destroying it, but of course there's exceptions. The exception would be if the mother's life is in danger, then you have to abort that child, because that child is considered in Torah law a murderer. The child is going to murder the mother. Now, obviously, only a doctor could do that. So we're not talking about God forbid an abortion, because oops, that wasn't planned, or oops, I don't have the money for it, or oh, I'm too young, or I wasn't married, I didn't plan on getting pregnant. Then give it up for adoption. Deal with it. You can't just do an abortion because, you know, it's convenient for you. And again, I didn't want to get into this topic because it deserves its own time and attention. But I am giving the example of, according to Torah law, if the fetus is putting the mother's life in danger, then you must abort because that is a threat to human life. And the mother's life comes first. Okay. Having said that, the Torah says the following, and fascinatingly, and I think it might be the first time in history, the Prime Minister of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu, and I'm not taking sides, but he happens to be the Prime Minister. And just last week, when he stood up in, in, in uh, the United Nations, he quoted this Talmud. And the Talmud says, quote, The Torah instructs us, Haba lahargai hargacha hashkem v'hargai. If one is coming to kill you, rise up to kill them first. It doesn't matter if it's a Jew or a non-Jew. It doesn't matter if it's an adult or a child. It doesn't matter anything other than the fact that a human life is now at threat. You must eliminate that threat, period. Now, if there's another way to stop it, great. But if you need to kill that threat, then that's what you have to do. So very simply put, in American law, if you see somebody about to murder someone else, an innocent person is about to be murdered, and you don't do anything you can you can even take out your phone and start taking a video of it and live feeding it and posting it and somebody was murdered and you could stand there and laugh you're cruel you're evil you did nothing against the law american law according to torah law you are a murderer you could have stopped somebody and you didn't you are guilty you're not an innocent bystander you could have and should have done something so if you see somebody about to murder someone else, you have a moral obligation to stop them. Now, if you have the ability to chop off their legs and that would stop them, great. But if they have a weapon in their hand, especially a gun, and there's no other way other than taking care of them, that's what you need to do. When Israel bombs and destroys Nasrallah, you say, but he was sitting and, and you know eating, having pita and hummus in his bunker. He's an evil man that was actively planning to kill innocent people, Jew and non-Jew alike. There, there were Arabs and Muslims who died because of him too, many. You have a moral obligation to eliminate him. That's the Torah law. Clear as day. Now, when Israel followed this, and they have, and they preempted, they saw resounding success. Who can tell me Anyone here or the 20, 25 people or so on Zoom? It's hard to count here, but a couple dozen. Who can tell me, go anywhere in the world and ask, which of the many wars of Israel did Israel decisively win? Go. Six-day. Six-day war. Yeah, but they, they, they had that... Um, 
Security Council thing that uh, Israel had to give it back. So, so he, We're not talking about what happened afterwards. There were mistakes afterwards. They, We're talking they, about the war they, itself. They, win the they won the war. They won the war. My grandfather, I, I quoted one grandfather, Max Jaffe, with the Yiddish, uh, blessed memory. My other grandfather, Jack Muchnik, who was a World War II veteran. He was a navigator in World War II. He did over 30 missions as a navigator in the B-24s over Nazi Germany. He had, and he lived in Philadelphia where my father grew up. He passed away about 15 years ago. My son, Yaakov, is named for him, Arik. His name was Jack. He he was a, you know, he, he was a veteran. He was very proud of, of the military, and he was a proud Zionist. He wasn't a religious Jew, per se. He had on his uh, coffee table in his home in Broomall, Pennsylvania, where we would go and visit, a copy of the Time magazine from June 1967. He was so proud of it. He had the original copy showing Israel's victory. What did Israel do at that war that they sadly didn't do often enough? Yeah. They preempted. We discussed this at length in the first class. Time doesn't permit it. We went into great detail. And we contrasted it with the six day of the, the Yom Kippur War, just a number of years later, where Israel, Golda Meir, who was the prime minister at the time, made a, an, an, an unfortunate call that let Israel be attacked first so that the world wouldn't call us the aggressor. And as a result, we lost um, way too many soldiers, about 2,500. And the world still, many say that Israel lost that war, including, you ready for this next screen? There is a museum in Israel. That's what you're looking at. It's in called Egypt. in Egypt. Thank you. It's it's in Egypt in Cairo. It's called the October Six Museum, and it is to celebrate Egypt's victory over Israel. They bring kindergarten school children there to show them. They have pieces of uh, of Israeli um, Air Force uh, planes that were shot down. They show this is the, the destruction of Israel and Egypt to one inside. And that's Egypt that we supposedly have a peace treaty with. Yes. We're like the top. Jerome crossed the canal. Were you talking about 67? I'm talking about the Yom Kippur War. Yom Kippur War. Of course we didn't really win. And the we're, proof the proof is that now, we're still suffering, including now, October 7. Go ahead. Jerome crossed the canal. Yeah. And they surrounded the, the, the Egyptian Third Army. Yeah. And they cut off the water supply. And they, they could have utterly humiliated Egypt, but they were stopped by America. Yes, that's true. That's true. We're going to talk about that. It's actually in the second part of the class, which we're going to get to, about America's... Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about America's involvement in Israel. We're just doing general. We, if we went through each war and each situation, we would be here for uh, at least six days, like the six-day war. So, <clears throat> it's all important information. But we're giving a general overview. It's just impossible to go through everything. The point here is, is that Israel experienced long-lasting national trauma when they didn't follow the heat of the Torah, that you need to preempt and stop a threat before it attacks. And they lost international military respect, and it undermined Israel's deterrence. Um, I, I don't know if we have time to play all the videos from last week, but one of them was where the Rebbe speaks about how Israel had uh, America on the ninth day of the Yom Kippur War, they airlifted and they brought arms and they uh, Richard Nixon, they came to Israel's assistance. Yay, Mazel Tov, we're here to save you. Well, guess what? So uh, that's used by some to argue that Israel does need America's help and America came to help it. And if they didn't listen to America and they did preempt, like they did in the Six Day War, they wouldn't have had America's help. The Rebbe points out, what day was that? Nine days. The Six Day War was won by day six. There wouldn't have been a ninth day. America finally woke up and helped. And as we'll talk it later in the class, America, which we're blessed to live in, and is a, uh, a country of kindness, and is, is indeed a friend of Israel, but its first and primary concern is itself. And anything it does to help Israel is if it's good for itself, as it should. Every country is supposed to be concerned about themselves first. I mean, actually, just I'll give you. Some, I have an interesting reading on that. Go ahead. Not America. Mm -hmm helped on that. Um, trying to remember the Defense Department person. He specifically went against orders and helped Israel. There were some I that did that. Hey, there were, there were absolutely on a number of occasions. Absolutely. Uh, in the address in 1982, which is during the Lebanon War, that's when 
my father-in-law, who was with us, Rosh Hashanah, lost his brother, his younger brother. He was only 19 years old. Uh, and and by the way, that was unfinished business, which we talk about. We'll we'll talk about finishing the job once you're doing it. Um, so during that time, the Rebbe said the following: In order to expedite God's protection over every Jewish person, I will give each and every one of you, the, the participants there, a dollar bill to give to charity, especially for the merit of the soldiers of the IDF, that they that they may succeed in finishing the operation with minimal losses, or better yet, no losses at all. And here's the point. Swiftly completing the operation will also prevent unnecessary enemy casualties. The Arabs, we're worried about them too. They're also created in God's image. We don't want innocent Muslims and Arabs to die. They are too are human beings created in the image of God. And it is the duty of a Jew to also care for the lives of each and every non-Jew. Let's talk about our current situation. Israel knew that Hamas, first of all, the disastrous mistake of giving the territory to our enemy, which we're going to talk about is against Torah law. What Israel did with the disengagement from Gaza was against Torah law, period. Now, once they did that, what did the Palestinians do? They went ahead and they started building terror networks. They built the terror tunnels. They smuggled in missiles, et cetera, et cetera. And they started launching those missiles against Israel. It didn't just start October 7. They were already launching missiles for quite a while. Speak to the people who live in the border cities, Sterot, Beersheba, et cetera. And then October 7 didn't happen in a vacuum. It, and Israel knew about it prior. So now you're going to tell me that, uh, yeah, you know, it's always best that we wait until there's an issue and then we deal with it then, not preempt. So now you have 40,000 Palestinians dead. Never mind the Hamas terrorists. Whereas if you got rid of them before they built and, they, and they, they, they had the capabilities to do what they did on October 7, there would be less Palestinians dead. So the Rebbe says, following the Torah's advice of murdering, of, of eliminating a murderer before they kill you, which seems harsh, it seems, but it's, if you're, the Talmud says, if you're kind to the cruel, you'll end up being cruel to the kind. You said they knew about October. The Jews knew about. They didn't. October? They didn't know about October seven, but they knew that they were building up some sort of a some sort. They had intelligence. They knew about the tunnels. They knew what was being smuggled in. Absolutely, but they didn't want the world to condemn it. They could have stopped it long ago. Israel didn't want the world to condemn that. Israel. Okay, let me tell you. A story. Why wouldn't they want the world? Let to me condemn tell you a story. An American, a Frenchman. And an Israeli are traveling right. and they're caught by cannibals. Right. Okay. The cannibals want to eat them for dinner. Right. They give them each a last wish. The American, what's your last wish? Oh, let me watch my football on my big screen. Give me a big, a big bowl of wings and a and a case of beer, and then you could kill me. All right. The American, the Frenchman, give me a friend, fine French wine, beautiful dinner, play some nice music and romance, and then you can kill me. They turn to the Israeli, what do you want? He says, What do I want? Give me a kick in the tuchus. Give me a kick in my ass. So the guy says, "That's what." Yeah, yes, that's what I want. He gives him a kick. As the Jew supposedly falls over, the Israeli supposedly falls over, he manages to reach into his boot where he has a gun hidden. He pulls out the, his gun. He shoots the cannibals. He takes the American and the French. He says, "We're saved." They run away. They run away saved. So they're saved. So the American and the Frenchman turn to the Israeli and they say, "That's amazing." But let me ask you something. Why did you ask him to kick you in the tuchus? He said, I, you want the UN to condemn me for being the aggressor? First he has to kick me, then I could react. Now it's a funny joke, but think about it. There's, they're about to be killed, but he needs them to kick him in the tuchas. You understand? This is the mistake that Israel has done too many times. And the Rebbe spoke about this many, many there also, times. There were also the, the, the women that were, uh, my understanding, the young female IDF that were lookouts. Yeah. And they relayed messages that yeah, unfortunately, it was ignored. Happened. It wasn't taken seriously. Yes, That's yeah. I don't know why, but the... because they fell asleep at the wheel. But we're going to talk about it yeah. because they didn't take this idea seriously that threats have to be eliminated. They thought Hamas. They didn't. They underestimated oh, yeah. how much of an imminent threat it is. But when there's there, there shouldn't have they been the threat to begin yeah. with. That's the point we're saying. Yeah, Let's watch we'll the next video of the Rebbe's sense. talk. Hold on, I have to share another one. Give me a second. And that's interesting. interesting if that would come out in an inquiry, how could they say that? Because if that seems likely, how could they even? 
to draw that conclusion in public. Oops, I'm sorry, give me a second. Bear with me. Uh, to go to the video in this particular case, I have to go to a different PowerPoint. And then who would listen to it? Okay, okay here we are. Who would listen to it? Well, Israel should, you know. And at this point, who really, if they won't listen to it, so be it. The world, we're going to talk about how the world respects those who respect themselves. Okay, here goes. Hmm. Or so I thought. Come on, you can do this. We did it before. Let's go. Hmm. I love technology. I love technology. Don't we all? That uh, sound usually means you have to close something. I know. I know. It. Um, let's try one more Can idea. Can you pass that a uh, Baron heads on the line? This is a good time for me to try it. <laughs> the different. No, I haven't. All right. I will try one more way. And other than that, we will have to move on. Okay. This one is supposed to play file. Okay. All right, on Zoom, as soon as I hit uh, this, let me know if you can see a video starting. And again, uh, by the way, I, it's easy to play here. It's the challenge is to do it for both, both Zoom and in person. That's the, the challenge I'm having here. I will not start, I will not try again. So suffice it to say that in that clip, which we just did show the first round, the Rebbe is speaking about how Israel has to do, according to Torah law, the right thing. And when it does, the world respects it. Yeah. Now, we also went over many texts in the booklet, it's on page 14 and 15, from the Torah, giving up, it, it, delineating our right to the land. And this is very important. And the Rebbe would repeat it many, many times, not just to his listeners, it's Hasidim, but when he met with Israeli leaders, our claim to the land of Israel is not for historical, listen to me closely, please, because this is a mistake that Israeli leaders often make. Netanyahu, as right-wing as he supposedly is, when he was speaking in the United Nations, he speaks about this is the land and King David and King Solomon and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and Joshua prophesies from. It's all true. It's historically true. But our right to the land is that it was promised by God in the Bible to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants as an everlasting inheritance. Genesis chapter 12. The original promise, Genesis chapter 15, the covenant with Abraham, Exodus 3, at the burning bush, God promised it to Moses, Deuteronomy, God promised it to Moses again, that they'll be in exile and they'll return. And Deuteronomy at the end, it also speaks about the gathering of the exile. And then if you go to page 16, we have in Psalms and in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel and in Hosea, time and again, time and again, and that is our claim to the land. Is that different than what Netanyahu said? He spoke about the historical fact that Jews have always lived in the land. True. But why? That's not our only right. Because you can claim that things change. Mm -hmm. Times change. Geography changes. Mm -hmm. You know, people used to live here and then there was a war and they're moved out. And that's just the way it is. Tough it up. Our right to the land of Israel is because it was promised by God forever. That's our right to the land. Not white papers, not Belfort decorations, not UN resolutions. We don't need any of that. Which is why... You speak to your typical Chabad rabbi, they won't even refer to the land of Israel as, as um, the country of Israel from 1948. Yeah, something significant happened in 1948. The world supposedly recognized the Jews' right to the land. But that's not our reference point. Our reference point is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
And there was a, a Jewish presence ever since, not just because we happen to live there, because we have a direct connection to the land. Now, I'm going to show you this in the next clip. Unfortunately, the other clip didn't work, and that's okay. It wasn't meant to be. But please, God, this clip will work because this is important. And from here, we'll take it to the um, strategic elements that we are we started focusing on and we'll continue tonight. Okay? So here we are. Um, as I mentioned, here we are. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, Israel's the three principles for saving lives are number one. Um, why am I not seeing what's there? Number one, if someone is coming to kill you, rise up to kill them first. We just spoke about that preemptively and eliminate security threats. Number two, and we didn't get to it. There was some of the videos, but we did it the first time. That when you do besiege a city, you have to do it all the way till the submission. And we had there the talk about how in the Yom Kippur War, the Rebbe had one of his advisors, it was Israeli, Rabbi Klein, a blessed memory. My niece actually just married his grandson uh, this summer. My niece from LA. Um, and I, I emceed and officiated that wedding and mentioned that he's the grandson of one of the Rebbe's uh, confidence and, and secretary's aides, Rabbi Benjamin Klein. So he was Israeli, and he had, he did these secret calls and connections between the Rebbe and Israeli leaders. He called the right-hand man of um, Moshe Dayan. I, I'm pointing to my eye because I'm, I was trying to remember his name by thinking of the patch, the eternal patch he had on one of his eyes. He lost an eye in one of the wars. Moshe Dayan was the, was the chief of staff at the time. And the Rebbe told him, during the Yom Kippur War, to go to Cairo and go to Damascus. To Cairo and to Damascus. Because once they already were winning, go all the way. Why? Because as we studied in the first class, we had the text, that when you besiege a city, we have it in the book over here, look at page 20, please. Deuteronomy 20, chapter 20, verse 19, 20. When you besiege a city for many days to wage war against it, to capture it, the Torah says, besiege the city that makes war with you, ad ridita, in Hebrew, which means until its submission. Now, the Six-Day War was till submission. The world knew that Israel won. World War II, for example, and this it was not a clear victory. And guess what happened? World War II came as a result with millions and millions of people, including the six million Jews in the Holocaust, oh, World War II. No, World War One was not a clear victory. World War One was not a clear victory, and that's why Pearl Harbor happened, and the world continued. But if there was a clear victory, it would have been over. Uh, so what happens is the Torah says you have to do too. So the Rebbe told Diana, that was the video, that they should go till Damascus and Cairo for twenty-four hours. Hold on to their, um, what's the word for the main cities? Their uh, capitals for twenty-four hours. Then you leave. It's not part of Israel. We have no interest in Damascus or or or, uh, or Beirut, rather Beirut. But hold on to it. Cairo, 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 and Damascus. Hold on to it to show victory. So there should be no doubt. And they didn't. And instead, turn back a page nineteen. And what do we have here? We have here the October sixth museum in Cairo, where they're showing victory of the Yom Kippur War. But if Israel, if Israel went into Cairo. The IDF surrounded the city okay. they, until submission, like the Torah says. So that's B. Besiege a city. If they annihilate. Why is the next clip not going? Hold on. Go ahead while I'm figuring this out. I'm with you. Shimon, what were you going to say, Peter? Okay. Also, when they cut off the why would the Egyptian third army turned off the uh, water? Uh -huh. I mean, if they if they had annihilated, they they had forced them to surrender all, all their weapons. And, Correct. And go into captivity. That is to, that is exactly right. Prisoners of war. That is exactly right. They, they should have done that. That is them. exactly right. And and the response from Moshe Dayan was, "I don't have the military ability to do it." 
And when they called that back to the river, they said, you're making a big mistake, a very, very big mistake. All right. So that's number two. B, besiege the city until submission. The enemy must unequivocally be defeated, as we just read here, text five from the Torah's teachings. And C, in a city near the border, even if they come just to plunder straw or hay, we initiate a military offensive. We never see a strategic defensive position. We did not get to this in first class. So let's see inside. Look at page 21. We all know that the, the guidance we take as Jews is from the Torah. And the Torah's teachings and practical day-to-day -day guidance is brought down in the Shulchan Aruch and the Code of Jewish Law. The Code of Jewish Law states the following. Page 21, text uh, text 7 8. And those on Zoom, uh, you won't have the text, but it's, we're referring to principle C here for saving lives. If non Jews besiege Jewish cities, the law is as follows. If their goal is monetary, we do not desecrate the Shabbat to protect ourselves. In other words, if they come to steal, you're not allowed to stop them because there's laws of Shabbat. And you can't just take up arms to stop somebody from taking your money on Shabbat. It's not permitted. But if they come to kill or with no presented reason, so we might be concerned that they may be here to do damage to our bodies, not our, our possessions, we go out with weapons and desecrate the Shabbat and battle them. By the way, that's a justification today for a Jew, if necessary, to be armed on Shabbat. How are you allowed to be armed on Shabbat? You can't. The gun is not in the spirit of Shabbat. It's not. It's not permitted to carry. The answer is if your life, if you, if you, if your life may be in danger, and unfortunately, as a Jew, in in many areas and so on, if you're living alone in the middle of nowhere on a farm and there's no one around you, then you have no have a right to. You keep your rifle at home. But if you're at a synagogue, at a, at a, at like here, we are here, we have we have Jews armed if necessary in order to protect. Now that's in general. But if you're in a city near the border, even if they just come to plunder straw or hay, in other words, little nothing, they're coming to steal a little straw or hay, leave it alone. We initiate a military offensive, even if this entails desecrating the Shabbat. Why? Because a border city is critical. Because if they get their way with law with the hay, they may go further and eventually want to take your possessions and then your homes, and therefore they're ready to take your lives. And therefore, you have to be ready to desecrate Shabbat. Guess what? The Rebbe would repeat this many, many, many times. Israel is a border city. It is surrounded by enemies. And it's it, the land is so small. It's the size of New Jersey. We, we don't fathom how small Israel is. And the, relative to the United States, for example. So... Because it's so small, because it's surrounded by enemies, the law of the whole land is a border city. And anybody who comes to say, oh, we just want to take some of your straw and hay, we need to be concerned about life and we need to be armed on Shabbat. That's why the IDF does everything they need to on Shabbat, not just when there's a wartime, but all year long, any Shabbat, any holiday, while we're praying on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there are religious Jews that are usually observant that are in airplanes and in army tanks, and not just when there's a war, even just to be defensive, just to protect, just to check. They're sitting on computers and watching surveillance cameras because it's always a danger. It's always a threat. It's a border city. It is an interesting discussion because not all Israelis are, are religious, as we know. So the discussion in the army, you have some that are Shabbat observant, some that are not. So there's a discussion amongst the, the modern day rabbis who should be the ones to be put into when there's wartime, everybody has to do everything. But when you have the luxury to decide to do so who should do the jobs that are technically like not permitted on Shabbat? Writing, driving, using phones, technology. Should you maybe you should use the ones that are anyways not Shabbat observant? Most of the rabbis interestingly say on the contrary. Put the ones that are Shabbat observant. Because they are not considered desecrating the Shabbat when they do that, because it's to protect lives. And they're only going to do what they have to. And they're doing it to honor Shabbat, as opposed to the one that doesn't care about Shabbat to begin with. So they're not honoring Shabbat by doing that. They're, of course, doing, doing what they have to do. We're talking about if you have the luxury to make these decisions. It's just a fascinating idea. So it's not considered desecrating Shabbat. It's the honor of Shabbat to protect lives. And as is brought down in text 7b, from one of the commentators on the Code of Jewish Law, Halacha views a city alongside the border 
differently for fear that if the enemy conquers it, it will be a launching pad that will allow them to conquer the entire land with greater ease. Read this and think about Gaza. Read this and think about Hezbollah in the north. They're border cities. And if they could breach the borders, they have easy access to the rest of the land. And the same as in Yehud and Shamron, what the world calls the West Bank. Israel is a very small, sensitive place. And every single part of it has to be watched and protected. By the way, that's also the argument why even though the Sinai Desert technically is not part of biblical Israel, but it made it buffer, it gave us a buffer. And the same is with the Golan Heights. And the same is with the part of the West Bank that gives us a buffer between us and our enemies. Who, where did October 7 reach? It reached the borders, the closest. If they had the ability to continue further in, they would. Where did Iran just launch ballistic missiles to? To Tel Aviv, because they want ultimately take over the whole country and kill every Jew if they could, God forbid. So the law is very clear that in a city near the border, even if they come just to plunder straw, hey, we initiate a military offensive. We never cede a strategic defensive position. Let's continue the PowerPoint here. If I can. Soon. Okay. Hello. You could never have this issue. Okay, here we go. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're just going to briefly go through this. Our claim to the land of Israel is not just historical. And they show us an example Rachel's tomb. We know that the Jews have been there for thousands of years. And it's not because of international law. That's the Belfort Declaration, which eventually led to the UN resolution. And it's not just because of Jewish survival. Big mistake that Israel did in the early years and did it time and again which is to constantly repeat that if we don't want another Holocaust, we need to have a land of Israel for us. Really? That's the reason for Israel? Many Israelis got tired of that. And a lot of those Israelis that were brought up with that reasoning are living here in the San Fernando Valley or Northern Israel or in Hawaii or you know, you name it. And many of them are not even religious or married to Jews anymore. It doesn't work because it's not the ultimate truth. We're not in Israel just because we need a safe place to be. Of course, Israel can and should be a safe haven for Jews. There's no question about it. But that's not a, the, a, enough of an argument why we belong there. Our claim is not it. also all of these, but that's not the root of it. Rather, as we've been discussing, I can't do this each time in the Zoom business. Rather, as we've been discussing, somebody pray for our PowerPoint here, please. Thank you. Thank you for the prayers. Okay, good. Thank you. Rather, it's the Torah, and we read some of the, the verses from the Bible, that God promised it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By the way, you've heard the expression, from the river to the sea? This is the original, from the river to the sea. That God promised it to Abraham, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. That's from the river to the sea. Okay. Now, the source of this is the beginning of the Torah, where God says he created the heavens and the earth. And the Torah is not a book of history. It's a book of instructions. Rashi, the foremost commentator of Torah, he's the 11th century French scholar. Every edition of Chumash around the world, the five books of Moses, has Rashi's commentary on it. He lived a thousand years ago. He wrote what's the most well-known commentator on the commentary on the Torah. He brings on a medrash that's from 700 years prior to him, from Rabbi Yitzchak, which is why does the Torah begin with Genesis? If the Torah is a book of instructions, it should begin with the first mitzvah. The first mitzvah in the Torah is the mitzvah of the Jewish calendar. Why does it begin with the creation? And what he answers is, and the, uh, that quote, very important this, and the Rebbe repeated this many times. If the nations of the world will say to Israel, you are thieves for having conquered the lands of the seven nations. This sounds like somebody could say this today demonstrating now on campuses across the country saying this today. Rashi is quoting this a thousand years ago from the Medrash from 700 years prior. The nations will say to Israel, you are thieves. And by the way, this is before the modern state of Israel. You are thieves for having conquered the lands of the seven nations. Israel will reply, 
the entire world is God's. That's why the Torah begins with Bereshit. He created it, and he granted it to whoever he desired. It was his to give it to the seven nations originally, and it was his to take it from them and give it to us. First Rashi on the Torah, why the Torah begins with Genesis. This is our right to the land. Our right to the land is that God promised it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as nachlat olam and everlasting inheritance. So again, our reason for the land of Israel is because God promised it, that it's ours. And the, the security of Israel is not just because of the holiness of the land. It's because of the holiness of a Jew and of life. And you would follow the same laws in Oxnard or anywhere else in the law, in the world to protect lives. If we had the need for the IDF to do the same thing here, they can and should do the same thing here. If there was a threat right next to us that was planning to murder us and kill us, we need to eliminate them first. Now move that same scenario to Israel and call it Hamas or call it Hezbollah, etc. It's the same idea anywhere at any time. It's the Torah's laws. These laws predate 1948. They predate all the modern day issues and who was there first and who came second and who's the colonists and who came and who moved who in and out and which war started. All of that is immaterial, the Rebbe repeated again and again and again. It's, it's from Hashem in the Torah. Let's continue. And here you're going to see a video of the Rebbe saying that, that this is the only good answer. Watch. Please work this time. Please work. Why would it show there but not there? And it is showing on Zoom. All right. I, I really, it's really too bad because that was a very important clip. Um, but it's essentially the Rebbe explaining the importance of that Rashi. I'll try one more time. I don't know why the issue is. Okay, let's continue. But again, you're not seeing, you're not seeing. Let me stop this for a second. Hi, everyone on uh, Zoom. You're all hanging in there? Hi, Ruth. Hi, yes. Lula. Okay, good. Hi, Jeff. I apologize. The Not all the videos are playing properly um, tonight. I've done this a number of times and I haven't had this challenge. I'm not sure what the issue is. Um, I think it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. We get into the rest of it. You're still, you're still getting the idea. Okay. It's just much, um, it's much better when you hear it from the Rebbe in the original. And there's also interviews like the, like that we had. Um, so I'll continue trying. If it doesn't go, we'll continue the class because I'm, I'm saying the Rebbe's words, but it's much better to hear it in the original. And I can send you the videos afterwards. You can watch them yourself. So let me give, uh, let me give this one more shot here. Please move this window away from shared application. Your shared application is paused. I don't I can't say I understand what that means. Maybe now? We can't see it yet. Hold on. Um, yeah. I've never had this. I've done this many times. Okay. Can you minimize it and then minimize what? Minimize this window. Okay. Sure application Maybe this video. way. See, but you're seeing it. They're not. They're not seeing it. On, uh, they're not seeing it on. Uh, we can hear it. Can you hear it just because it's in the background next to me. Hold on. I think it. I think you're going to see it now. Okay. 
Here we are. Okay, now you can see it on Zoom and in person. <laughs> So there's a powerful point the Rebbe makes there, which is <clears throat> that that the only reason the, the uh, all the other answers haven't worked, and the only reason this answer, which is the answer of the Torah, hasn't worked is because Israel's not using it to say it clearly. This land was given by you know who says it? God bless them. The Christians say it. Yeah. Proudly, because they they study the Bible, and they don't have an inferior complex. The, the, listen to me closely. If there's one idea you're going to get from this, it's the following: the undercurrent of the Rebbe's whole view of Israel's how Israel should approach its its, its security, etc., is this Jewish pride. The Rebbe didn't see a difference between Jewish observance and security and and policy and politics, the Rebbe looked past, instead of looking at the trees, the Rebbe saw the forest, the bigger picture. The issue at hand here is Israel is trying to fit in and be like everyone else. I spoke about it my first day, Rosh Hashanah, my sermon. Thank God, unfortunately, as because of tragedies, after October 7, a lot of Israelis and Jews around the world are waking up. When a Jew is proud of who they are, what they stand for, and not trying to just fit and be like everyone else. Then the world respects us. That's at the core of this. So for the Rebbe to get a Jew to put on tefillin somewhere, and to get a woman to light Shabbat candles, and for a Jewish child to study Alephet, and for a married couple to do the laws of family purity and mikvah, is the same as the IDF soldiers doing the right thing to defend the land of Israel, because it's all at the core of following Torah and being a proud Jew, practicing Jew. The fascinating thing. A lot of these political leaders would come and, and, and military strategists from Israel would come and talk to the Rebbe. They all sought the Rebbe's counsel. This photo here is President Shazar. And we had Prime Minister Begin while he was Prime Minister. He came to meet with Jimmy Carter, who just turned 100. He came to meet with him. And he wouldn't go to, the, to Washington before coming from Israel, going to Brooklyn to meet with the Rebbe to get his advice and blessing. They all knew that the Rebbe, because it's not, it's not just the Rebbe because he was a righteous man, it's because it's the Torah. And then and they would talk politics and they would talk military. And then when the Rebbe would start talking about being a proud, proud Jew and being a practicing Jew in Israel, they looked at it and they said, oh, Rebbe, okay, that's religious stuff. For the Rebbe, there was no separation. There is no separation between a religious part of Israel and a secular part of Israel. It's all one and the same because otherwise, what are you doing there? What's your connection to the land? It's a religious connection. Right. So the whole thing is religious. The whole thing is godly. The whole thing is spiritual. And that's why the Rebbe encouraged Israeli soldiers to put on tefillin, that it would give them strength. The same Rebbe that's concerned that they have the best weapons and that they have to preempt is concerned about them wearing tefillin because it's one and the same. Right. The Rebbe writes to President Shazar, in 1969, I'm not under the delusion 
that arguments based on principles of justice and integrity were prevailed in the United Nations, the Vatican, etc. In other words, the world doesn't care for your arguments, the Rebbe is saying. But a most important factor is the morale of the youth, including within the Israeli Defense Force and the students in the United States and elsewhere. <clears throat> so what happens when the world condemns us? We try to use arguments that we think they're going to accept. They're not interested in our arguments. It hasn't worked, says the Rebbe. What will make them listen when we say the truth? And what's the truth? The land will always be ours. It was given to us by God. And the Rebbe would repeat this again and again and again to anybody who would listen. Now, let's this is let's get to the final part as we we uh, we wind up the class. And I apologize that some of the videos didn't play. They're important, and I'll send you, please God, a uh, clip so you can watch them. Some of them are very heavy and passionate. There were speaks about mistakes being repeated and so on. Now let's talk about but the problem of world pressure. World pressure. The world pressurizes Israel. And we spoke in the first class. I went through some things about the pressure that was put on Israel during uh, the Yom Kippur War, and that's why they didn't want to be called the aggressor, and so on and so forth. Lebanon, and we, we watched a painful video where the Rebbe compared it to surgery. We have a doctor here. The Rebbe compared it to surgery where you cut someone open to accomplish something medically, and there's blood, and it's painful. And then before you finish the job, you close them up. You'll say, oh, if we have to, we'll go in another time. Any doctor, any person with a head on their on their shoulders says, that's, that's, that's the worst thing you can do. And the Rebbe said, that's the problem when the idea finally goes in and does these military necessary uh, operations to, to get rid of terrorists, whether it's Hamas or it's Hezbollah or PLO, whatever the case may be. And then the world starts pressurizing it and they said, okay, okay, okay. They give it the pressure and pull out. And they're worried about the support of the world, especially the United States. And we're going to talk about that, that the, the support of the United States is vital. But the United States, and I love this country, is first and foremost concerned about itself, as it should be. And the president of the United States at any time, any sitting president, is sworn into office to be concerned about its citizens. Is Israel an ally of the United States? Yes. You know why? Because it's in America's best interest to have an ally in the Middle East. By the way, and the Rebbe pointed this out. When did America start all of the weapon sharing, I don't know the technical terms, with Israel? After 67. Correct. After 67. Israel won the Six-Day War without America's help. It was French and British uh, warplanes or whatever the case may be. Thank you. And America offered afterwards. You know why America offered afterwards? Ooh, you're a strong uh, uh, power in the Middle East. And we have a lot of enemies out there. We like you. We want... We're going to be friends, right? We're going to share with you, but you're going to share with us. We share intelligence. In other words, we need you some ways more than you need us. Mm -hmm. Israel, unfortunately, time and again, gives into American pressure, which they shouldn't. Do they need the money? Of course. But they need their lives. And they need to do what's right. And ultimately, when Israel does what's right, the world respects it, and America especially. And there's examples of it. Let me see if the PowerPoint goes through it. Let's do this first slide. The rule of physics dictates that when force is successfully applied in a given area, the pressure will continue to increase. So when we allow America to pressure Israel, when Israel allows it to be pressured, what happens? It increases. When Israel makes a red line and says, no, don't pressure us into doing X, Y, and Z. That's against our best interest. Do you know what America will do? And that has happened many times when Israel finally puts a foot down. Okay, they pressure the Arabs instead to make concessions. <laughs> I remember uh, when they had the uh, raid on the Austeric, uh Yes, thank you. We're going to talk the, about that. The, the, the raid on the, Iraq uh, nuclear uh, reactor. Reagan, uh, the, the Reagan administration delayed the delivery of planes. The Reagan administration condemned it. Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk. Let's say the story the way it was. It was, I think, 1981. Yeah. Israel uh, uh, clandestinely attacked yeah. the nuclear reactor. 
By the way, you know, you know who was one of the pilots then, Ilan Ramon, right. who eventually became an astronaut yeah. and unfortunately lost his life in Colombia. Yeah. A... So when they did that, the story is told that an aide to President Reagan, who, by the way, was a good friend of Israel, mm -hmm. but has America's interest first, uh, mm -hmm. came to him, it was the middle of the night, and said, Israel bombed a nuclear reactor. They say his reaction was, well, boys will always be boys. But what did he do the next morning? He put on a suit and tie, you know, went in front of the media at the White House and condemned Israel. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people condemned Israel. UN, famously, but the UN all, all the time condemns Israel. So let's not even waste New our time. time. New York Times, go on and on. Fast forward, Bill Clinton and others since then, many said Israel did a great service for the world. 30, 40 years later, maybe, but everybody agreed that what Israel did was a good thing. 20 years later, whatever the case was because they respected the fact that... It, now, Reagan, I'm sorry, not Reagan, Begin, not Reagan, but Begin, the Begin Doctrine, was where he argued that Israel is not going to allow another Holocaust. And he correctly said the Torah's view, that if someone comes to kill, you have to eliminate them first. And all agree that the world is a better place without Saddam Hussein having nuclear weaponry. Fact. Mm -hmm. Then they condemned it. When Israel does what it wants, they're going to repeat it again and again. The world will listen. Let's watch this next clip called The Result of Concession from the Rebbe in 1981 during the Lebanon War. <laughs> so ultimately, that's what pressure does. And Israel has to stand strong. Now, the Rebbe continued, or, or rather, the, the, the Rebbe's guidance to Israel continues. Uh, hold on a second. Let me just make this a split screen. I'm, I'm doing some things that you guys don't see for the people on Zoom. I'm trying to navigate. Um, now, we have to be concerned about our security needs versus compromise. Compromise is not good for Israel. And our security needs versus security guarantees. Let's talk about that for a moment. Israel guarantee... I'm sorry. The United States of America guarantees a lot of things to Israel. And guess what? This may shock you, but it's a fact. They've changed their minds at times, mm -hmm. even though they promised certain things to Israel. Not because America is bad, but because the situation changed. Then it was a good promise to Israel because it was in America's best interest. As I said before, every country can and should be concerned about its own interest first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So Israel keeps on doing these painful concessions because of promises from America that oftentimes America doesn't even follow up through. Administrations change, views change. And this has happened a number of times. And here's some examples. Um, in 1956, Israel withdraws from Sinai after Egypt agrees to the, uh, uh, what, what does that stand for? United Nations something or other. Um, and that's supposedly that there's going to be promises coming to Israel's way when they need it. Well, guess what? In February of 1957, Eisenhower guarantees this agreement, and surprise, surprise, 10 years later, 1967, Egypt expels the peacekeepers and closes the Straits of Tehran. Where was the United States and their promise? They were busy with other things. Vietnam, whatever the case, they had their own internal issues. Promises are promises. Israel conceded 
and did things it didn't want to do for promises from our friend. Israel is not meant to trust even its best friend. It has to do what it needs to do that's best for itself. Yep. Now, why is U.S. support Israel? First of all, U.S. is a kind country and it knows the truth and it knows the difference between good and evil. But also, it's, it wants a strong and needs a strong partner. A, strategic alliance only began after you discussed earlier, after 1967, after we blatantly disregarded America's warning not to attack. Israel did it anyways, and America says, I like you. I like that you're assertive. I like that you do what you need to do to protect yourselves. Ultimately, America and the world respects Israel when it does what the Torah says, which is to protect lives and belief that it's a God-given land. B, ever since becoming allies, we have never sadly won a decisive battlefield victory because the, the uh, Israel too often gives un into American pressure. Also, remember, the U.S. simply wants problems to go away. So they're just trying to find the solution. So shh, 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 shh. they're worried about, oh, you know, there's there's noise in the Middle East. Shh, we don't want this to, to go any further. A, since America wants to be seen as a peacemaker, we'll always apply pressure at the weakest link. It's trying to make peace now between Israel and Hamas. Peace between Israel and Hamas? Israel re is ready to do very painful things for peace. Ehud Barak offered 97% of Gaza and the West Bank for a Palestinian state to Yasser Arafat at the Camp David Accords. And, and it was outright rejected. You know why? Because they don't want peace with Israel. They don't want a side-by-side -side America talks about two-state solution. The Palestinians don't want a two-state solution. They don't. They want Israel off. That's what they teach their kids. Yeah. I mean, when, when that happened, I was, like, I, I supported that Oslo Accord back in, I mean, I was hopeful about it. Right. But when that happened, I knew I was completely wrong. Correct. Well, good that you changed your mind. And you know what? Many have slowly there's there. Was, uh, there's still people in Israel. There's yeah. still some in Israel that think that what Israel did with the disengagement was a good idea because it would it was too much territory for Israel to oversee. Uh, it's filled with 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 the Arabs, anyways. Yeah. I'm not saying the solutions are simple, but one thing is clear that whenever Israel does something that that compromises its security in the name of peace, it has backfired time and again. That's a fact, mm -hmm. historical fact. Because they're not going, they're not following the Torah's teachings. And Torah's and, teachings are: you have to preserve life. Every Jewish life, every human life, is sacred. And and these people on college campuses, they're 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 screaming from the river to the sea. People on college campuses they're, are they're misguided, the and they've been they've been uh, indoctrinated by sadly teachers and professors who are also misguided and are and are. And but, it's but, it's but, quite but, shocking. But the Arabs. Not the, the Arabs are saying that. Depends so, which Arab. The well, average Arab recognizes on, Israel. On college and, campuses. And the, and the, the Arabs, you know, I was I was speaking to an Iranian here, a neighbor of ours. She was showing me videos. Well, she's not an Arab. Whatever, fine. She, but she, she's a Persian. She was showing me. No, she's don't, not, she was, don't call them an Arab. They'll get offended. I, I understand. She was showing me videos of how when um, Nasrallah and then also the other killing in, in Iran of the, the, the Hania, whatever, how they're all celebrating. And, they're, and they have signs pro-Israel and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the same is in Lebanon and the same is even in Gaza. They're, you don't hear them. They're the wow. silent majority. The people who suffer the most are the, are the Arabs under the terrorists, under these terrorist regimes. Okay. And they support they Israel support because Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. They, they still support Hamas in, in Judea, uh, Samaria, uh, yes. and in Gaza. They still support And that's because they've been brainwashed and because they're living in... More uh, than that. I don't All see, right. but I don't, I don't see yeah. how they can do a one-state solution. I don't see how they can do a two-state solution. Yeah. And I don't see how they can unbrainwash them. It's All a big, those things are a mystery. It's a big problem. But one thing is for sure, Israel has to start listening to what the Torah says, because they're only rights to be there. If you don't listen to the Torah, which is the only, your, your only right to be in that part of the world, get the hell out of there. What are you doing there all together? Maybe we are colonists. Maybe we're on someone else's territory. No, God says we're there. Oh, God says we're there. Then listen to what God says. And God says that you have to put your the life and safety of your people first and foremost, and not make compromises. And if you see a threat, you have to eliminate it first. 
clear. And this was the Rebbe's guidance again and again. Guidance. And it sadly, and when Israel did it, they saw success. And when it's the opposite, it's the opposite. But we're talking about the pressure from America. Once we allow a conversation, it says the message that everything is negotiable. Let me give you an example. Rachel and I are blessed with uh, 10 children, thank God. Okay. Let's say, God forbid, right now somebody kidnaps one of my children, okay? Comes over here to the front door and says, prove to me that this is your child or else so-and-so or something or another. And I have to start now showing documents and start having an argument that 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 he or she was really born to me and my wife. And, that, and if the, I lost the argument once I start to answer. I'm going to, what I need to do is get my child out of your hands, period. I have no need to argue with you, to discuss with you. Once I do, I'm showing that you have a say, that there's actually a legitimate argument to be had. This is the problem. When we allow a conversation, the Rebbe was against Israel even having talk about concession of lands for peace. Shamir, who was one of the most right-wing prime ministers prior to Netanyahu, um, and, and the Rebbe encouraged him in his path about not giving away land to our enemies and so on. At one point, he wanted to have a conversation. I forgot who the president of the United States was at the time. He said, I came just to talk. The Rebbe said, you're making a mistake. By having a conversation about it, you're already putting Israel's life in danger. Just the conversation. And indeed, the uh, the uh, intifadas and all of that all started when there was negotiations about land peace. Well, anytime Israel shows any weakness, that's when we're attacked. That's when things are worse for us. Let's watch this next video where we're going to see the Rebbe's very clear guidance in 1989 about the slippery slope of concession and we're heading towards in the uh, position in the United States that is by Weizmann this is talking they had the hard day out from the house is but no again neither father's from from so long the father's hand is can this is a communist man and the other is so as you will turn as a or does a hate of the day high the key זה מה שהוא גם יעשה, מפני שזמנים לא קלים, התקופה לא קלה עכשיו, וצריך באמת הרבה... אבל הפיסרון והנגע, הדין הדין סר, הוא ההפך ממה שעושו עד דעתו, ועד דעתו אוכלסו בהקו שצורך לבטל בלי על משהו, על עניין מקריים, ובשביל זה יקבלו משהו, וזה ההפך של הטבע של רצס הברית. ארצס הבריס נסכיימה, נסייזדה, נסכיימה, על ידי זה שם דו חזק שמה שהוא חיוני בשבילו, אין אפשר בזה לבטא. אין מתחילים להפעיל את קשר אנגליה, שאלת נגדם, וצרפת פסטי, נגדם, כפי שואל קוס, כל העולם, או יוז נגד ארצס הברית. ובשביל שאוכל זה בקו זה, בזה הצליחו. הוא מצליח עם עד הימים הזה. אנחנו אומרים להם שמה שבשבילם עניינים של מדיניות חוץ, בשבילנו זה עניינים של קיום. זה הבדל גדול, רק לא תמיד קל להסביר להם את זה. זאת אומרת, מפני שיש לחץ ערבי ויש עכשיו הרבה מאוד לחץ יותר ממה שהיה בזמן האחרון. בין להם לי, בין שהמציאות, לדעתי, איננה כזו, המסכים הם בדיבור, שזה העיקר בשבילנו, אבל כאילו שנמצא עם הנדושים עם אומץ, לכן מוכרחים לבטא, וכאילו שהמסכים הם לבטא, אי אפשר למצוא הנקודה ששם אי אפשר לבטא. See, that was a very powerful point, that once you begin to compromise, everything's on the table. Now this, the Rebbe's, this, these points that the Rebbe's making in that video, is to, um, his name is El Yochum Rubinstein. He was a, uh, a veteran diplomat and legal expert in Israel. He was very involved, very influential with Israel's uh, internal and external affairs. And he was a member of Israel's delegation to the peace talks with Egypt in the 70s, Camp David Accords. Anyhow, but you see what the Rebbe tells him, <clears throat> that the U.S. values strength. And unfortunately, Israel is regularly weak in their negotiations just by having the negotiations all together. Okay, we have two more videos for tonight's class. Facts on the ground. A, in 1963, Israel developed nuclear capabilities despite heavy pressure from President Kennedy. B, in 1981, we bombed Iraq's nuclear reactor. We spoke about that. The United City Council unanimously passed a resolution condemning Israel. Uh, C, 
we need to populate, whoops, sorry, we need to populate these areas that are strategically important to Israel with civilian settlements. These are all things that the Rebbe highlighted that Israel did good and she could do more of. And ultimately, the United States and the world respects Israel for these things. Mm -hmm. Thanks. It. Now, you're going to watch Rabin, Yitzchak Rabin, a blessed man, he was a prime minister of Israel, and he was also uh, a, a top general and chief of staff with, with a, a meeting that he has with the Rebbe. He's going to quote about how the Rebbe mentioned this verse. So I, I want you to know the verse before, so because Rabin says it very in passing. It's a verse from Numbers where the Torah, it's from the prophecies from Bilam, speaks virtue about the Jewish people. And he says, behold, that the Jewish people are a people that dwells alone and is not reckoned among the nations. What that means, the best example is from Hanukkah, the menorah is kindled with oil. When you mix oil and water, what happens? Separate. It separates. We're reckoned. What is not, not reckoned means not like counted, not... Not not, among the family and yeah. nations. And you know, when the Jew is embarrassed about the fact that we're the chosen nation, that we're different than everyone else, and we try to fit in, who reminds us that we are different? The anti-Semite. The poor Jew is trying to look and sound like everyone else. Comes along the anti-Semite and says, you Jew. The Jew's like, what do you mean, me Jew? I changed my name. I got a nose job. You Jew. So, but the right thing to do is to celebrate it and to be proud of it. It's a positive thing. God, we're God's ambassadors, and, and the world respects that and looks up to us. Now listen to this powerful interview with Yitzchak Rabin about his interaction with the Rebbe. There's two more videos. Both are are actually it's it's the next one. Hold on. Yeah, this is it, I believe. I remember quite vividly this uh, discussion. It started uh, by a question that was put to me by the Rabbi: Aren't you feel alone? as the representative of the Jewish state among 120 uh, countries and peoples that are represented in Washington. From this beginning, uh, the rabbi uh, started uh, to deal with the question, Am Levadadishkon, what has kept the people of Israel always, always, little bit alone by choice or by outside pressure or rejection. It's by the two forces. First, by our own choice, by the Jewish people's own choice, to be what they are, to stick to the Torah, to the faith, to the tradition of the Jewish people for 2,000 years without a state inquisition expulsion, pogroms, no doubt the Holocaust. And regardless to all this, the Jewish people remain uh, faithful to the Jewish religion, to the Jewish tradition, and succeeded to survive what no people anywhere in the world uh, proved to be successful. I thought there was more of his... Video. I remember quite vividly this uh, discussion. Anyhow, you see, he's talking about his conversation with the Rebbe and how the Rebbe impressed upon him this idea that um, we need to be proud of who we are and not just try to fit in and be like everyone else because we have a mission. Here's a, a, a letter, and we're, this is the last text of tonight's class. Page 23 in the books, it's text number nine. It's a correspondence from the Rebbe. Um, on, the, on the screen, we have a little bit more, so I'll read it off the screen, but then you'll see where, I, where it jumps in here. As for the practical thing which Jews everywhere can do to help the present situation, Is it the same letter? December 1973. I think there's some more in the thing. Anyhow, um, as a, for the practical thing which Jews everywhere can do to help us present the situation, something which is most regrettably ignored, in line with playing down the obvious divine intervention in the most critical days of the war, 
is that every Jew must strengthen his bonds with the Torah from Sinai when God made us the chosen people. This is something of which we need not be ashamed. And then comes this next part. The psychological factor has an important role when two adversaries confront each other. We're in page text nine. When adversary sees that his opponent is spiritually and psychologically strong and self-confident and certain of his just cause and not prone to be impressed by the adversary or any non-Jew due to the inferiority co complex mentioned above, this is the best way of preventing wars, not only major wars, but even wars of attrition. Let's face it. The Muslims believe in the Torah. They believe that God gave the Bible to Moses at Sinai. They believe in it. They also have the Quran, but they believe in the, the, the Torah is the word of God. The Jews need to believe it. And we need to be proud of it. We need to be proud of what it says in it. And when we're proud and we're confident, they back down because they respect the Jew who respects Judaism. And history has proven that to be true. Jews have lived in Muslim countries for a very, very long time and were respected when they were keeping their faith and were serious about it. When you try to assimilate and fit in and try to bah, 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 all of a sudden the problems all begin. That's been that's been the case throughout history. So <clears throat> one more video here. This is a little bit more of that same letter. This is this is a powerful uh, point. It is surely necessary to point out to you an MD. The psychological factor was such an important role when two adversaries confront. That's where the ending here was. Okay. Last but not least, a talk in 1971, the Rebbe speaks about a non-Jewish senator that goes to Israel. Now, usually people go to Israel to see the sites. And Israel is, I mean, it's a fascinating country. And it's a, it's, a, it's miraculous what it's accomplished and in modern state of Israel such a short period of time. But the Rebbe talks about what really impressed the senator. Watch this. Von den Komiteten wie jedes Archiv, Delis in Kongress und im Senat und hat übrigens seinen Eindruck. Danach ist er gefahren, am zweiten Mal, hat ihn bewiesen, mehr Schiori, mit ihm bewiesen, im Kessel Marovi, nie dem Kessel Marovi, wie er ist zugeputzt. Da dem Kessel Marovi, wie sie stehen, Eden und Davne und angeteilt mit einem Schieße von der einen Seite früh und von der zweiten Seite Männer. Nie die Anim und die Bettler, was sie seine Mewalbel zu der Tfile und Betten zu docken. You never been to the wall, you understand. Dann noch hat man noch hereingeführt in der Stiebe und in der Ischiebe mit zu brochen, in der Bank und Hulu, ist er gekommen zu fahren, der noch in Washington gesagt, ich der hat er gesehen, der Holy Land. Und der noch hat er mit Sajeje gewähnt, mit all Gemma Phantom. So what impressed the senator was not all the universities and not all the big buildings and not all of the technological accomplishments, but when he saw the holiness of the land, he saw the a, a, a small shtibol, a small synagogue with the broken benches, and he saw the kotel with the with the Jews and with the beggars asking for tzedakah and so on and so forth. So bottom line is, we have a Jewish identity. See, there's Israeli soldiers with a with a with a Torah, and there's an Israeli soldier next is tank praying before going out to war and um, we need to be very proud of who we are what we stand for and follow the torah's guidance let's um i'm gonna um, um okay we're gonna wrap up by reading the final page here which is a uh, key points of tonight's class key points okay yeah, i need a lachaim for this doc can you give me a little refill i have a long walk home <laughs> L'chaim, thank you. <clears throat> the final page, 24 and 25, key points. So it's been over an hour and a half tonight, and we even did an hour and a half originally. Tonight we tried to recap. There's some videos that I really would like you to see, those that weren't here the first time around. 
But for the next minute, when we do the key points here, is to really bring it all back together. All right, to the, those on Zoom, now's a good time to wake up. Here we go. All right, it's harder. And in person, you know, you know, it's not like a comfortable couch. You can't fall asleep. At home, you can fall asleep. Key points. Our right to the land of Israel stems from God gifting it to the Jewish people as an eternal inheritance. We quoted all the verses, etc. We need to believe this ourselves and clearly state this to the world. We gain the respect of the world when we speak our truth with conviction. This is a point that the Rebbe repeated often. Next, the supreme value that Torah places on preserving human life dictates the following rules. Number one, we must act preemptively to eliminate all security threats. And what Israel has recently been doing, not preemptive enough, but getting rid of Nasrallah, et cetera, et cetera, and whenever they get rid of the sources of those rockets and of the terror, they're doing the right thing. That's Torah's view. Two, when involved in a military operation, we must continue without let up until the threat is completely eliminated and the enemy, including the civilian population, fully understands that they have been defeated in the words of the Torah from Numbers, until submission, like Six Day War, not like Yom Kippur War, till submission. And as the Rebbe mentioned, it's better. There'll be less casualties on their side too. The enemy too. Three, we never surrender land that is strategically important for our security. For a small country like Israel, every piece of land is critical to the nation's security. Now, I want to pause here for a second. There are <clears> others, <throat> not Chabad, not the Rebbe's viewpoint, that talk about the reason for the fight uh, that Israel has to put their lives in the line for the Israel is because it's holy land and it's ours and we have to protect the holy land. That's true, but that's not the point the Rebbe repeated all the time. They were repeated all the time was security. Because if you're only talking about the Holy Land, well, you can argue parts of it are not part of the original biblical land. I'll give you an example. A lot. Never mind the Sinai Desert. Parts of the Golan and North. They're not part of biblical Israel. So you can say, fine, so give that away to the Arabs. If your argument is just that it's the Holy Land. Leave that for when Mashiach comes and work out the, the borders. The fact is, any land that's needed whether it's part of biblical Israel or not, to protect Jewish lives ha cannot be given away to enemies. It's as simple as that. But the Sinai, that was not ours, right? But the Sinai wasn't originally ours. But we so should keep it for a little bit of... Uh, once Israel it. captured it, you know that all of the terror in Gaza, where did it come from? It was infiltrated oh, yeah. through e Egypt and through the Sinai. They should have kept it as a buffer. Once you... But I you know that we're sitting in what was once Mexico? Once you Spain. conquer, or Spain, I don't care. Once you conquer area and you now need it strategic for your protection for the rest of your land, you must keep it. That's what you do. And that's what Israel, Israel made that mistake in the hopes of peace. It's never brought peace. It's brought more terror. It's, land for peace has never worked. It's always brought more terror. Yeah. Next, the last two points of tonight's class, the seminar. These rules are non-negotiable, and we follow them regardless of world opinion. Succumbing to pressure only leads to the world exerting more pressure. And by the way, as we said, ultimately the world comes around. The world recognizes that things Israel did was actually a good thing, even though they condemned it at first. So Israel has to do what it has to do, and if the world doesn't like it, like the kids in class go, na 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 na, or don't don't even respond, don't even respond. We have to take care of ourselves. This is what we have to do. And finally, all the above is the natural outcome of a strong sense of a Jewish identity, values, and pride. Cultivating Jewish identity is thus crucial to Israel's safety and security. And that's why for a Jew, even in America, anywhere else in the world, to be a proud practicing Jew is vital to Israel's security because it's all one and the same. Jewish pride and identity. The Rebbe's guidance was clear. The Rebbe's guidance was consistent, and the Rebbe's guidance is based on eternal Torah values. So in answer to the question of how does Israel win, and what's the Rebbe's vision for achieving lasting peace following the Torah's teachings? Preserving life, protecting our land, doing what we have to do, not being concerned about world opinion, and having a strong sense of Jewish 
pride, and practice. Amen. Let's hope and pray that Israel does this, that Jews do this. The good news is that since October 7th, there's a lot of things that Jews are doing better. Israel's doing better because of a very, very shocking, painful wake-up call. Let's hope they'll continue to do what they have to do. And ultimately, let's hope and pray that uh, God will bring peace to, to the world and to the region. And until then, Israel just has to continue protecting itself. And the more it protects itself and the more it does what it needs to, the more the world will respect it. And the more there'll be everlasting peace and security. Amen. 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 Okay. Can you take this?